just get short clothes. Good morning. Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program from the Dauphin Island Sea Lab Estuarium. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. And this morning we are coming to you live from the Grand Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, sometimes referred to as the NER or the NEAR. Um, and we are just across the Alabama state line in Mississippi, and we are going to chat with uh, the Grand Bay Nears uh, Stewardship Coordinator, Dr. Jonathan Pitchford, about pine savannas and uh, flatwoods and the efforts to protect these um, impacted ecosystems here on the Gulf Coast. So with that, I will let him get started. All right. Um, thank you, Mendel. Um, so some many years ago, uh, the Grand Bay Nears started working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to restore pine savanna and flatwoods habitats uh, within our boundaries. Um, recently, we were able to expand those efforts to include a lot of new areas because of the Grand Bay Land Acquisition and Habitat Management Project. Uh, this is a project that is funded by the Natural Resources Damage Assessment and is implemented through the Department of Interior and the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. And so now we have begun to uh, restore areas within about a 28,000 acre uh, project area. And there are a variety of habitats inside the project area, but the ones that we're focused on right now are the pine savanna and flatwoods habitats, kind of like what you can see behind me. So this would be considered a pine savanna, which is more of an open landscape, um, few trees kind of spaced out, and then a well-developed herbaceous layer. Um, so that would be the flowers and the grasses and things like that you see here. Um, one of the reasons that we got started with this work um, and that a lot of people are doing this type of work is because these habitats are themselves imperiled. Um, this is primarily from development and uh, fire suppression kind of throughout the southeastern U.S. where these habitats used to be the primary thing you would see would be these open grassland ecosystems if you went back a couple hundred years ago. Um, but now you know, they're really in jeopardy, and so a lot of effort now is going into restoring these habitats. Um, a big part of the project is land management. So we have a couple of different approaches that we're using to do land management activities. Um, one of those is mechanical treatments. So that could be um, mulching or select cutting, things like that, to get rid of uh, a very dense overstory and get rid of the midstory. So if you look at this area over here, you can see an area that has received one application of prescribed fire, but it's kind of got a little ways to go before it looks like a savanna. And you can see it's got a well-developed midstory, so a lot of dense shrubs throughout the area. But as we thin those with different treatments, we will start to increase the amount of light that can get to the floor of the forest and you start to get growth of things in the seed bank like forbs and grasses and things like that. So a lot of the plants that grow here um, are specially adapted to survive and uh, with regular fires occurring. Uh, some of them actually require it to survive. And uh, it's not only plants, there are a lot of different animal species that also are adapted to live in an area where fire occurs regularly. Um, so that's, that's the other, one of our other primary tools that we're using for management is prescribed burning. So we do prescribed burns about every two to three years um, across our project areas right now. And for the areas that we're kind of bringing into the project, that's the goal, to get them on a regular two to three year return uh, prescribed burn regimen. Um, what else? So one thing I was gonna say is that um, one of the species that's specially adapted to live in these environments, or actually depends on them, not so much adapted, are Henslow sparrows. So this savanna that we're looking at right here is one of the only savannas that we have right now that supports Henslow sparrows during winter. And uh, this is a species of migratory bird. They're very small, they're about this big. And we do find them here in the winter during our bird surveys. 
so a big part of our project is not only the land management but it's also the monitoring so we want to understand if our management activities are actually uh, working and so we do a very comprehensive bird and vegetation monitoring program associated with our restoration and uh, I think right now we've documented about 540 different plant species with our monitoring program we have about 13 different sites um, each site has two transects and we have to spend a lot of time getting on our hands and knees basically and identifying every single plant that we see along those transects. So it's uh, within a square meter here we could get up to 30 to 40 different species of grasses, sedges, forbs, things wow. like that. So very diverse community. And it's not just plants. Uh, we have a, a side project associated with our restoration that is focused on understanding how our management impacts reptiles and amphibians. And we've documented 45 different species of reptiles and amphibians with that work. Have you found gopher tortoises? Not on those surveys, but we have found gopher tortoises here. Um, they're not we want to find them and like get them incorporated into the data for this project, but so far on our surveys we haven't seen them. But we did see one, I believe it was two weeks ago, um, right on Bayou Heron Road, crossing the road. So we see them all along. Do you um, have burrows documented? We do have a few. We have a few burrows documented. You know, we're very low uh, environment here, like the elevation is low, so it's very wet a lot of the year but they tend to find areas like ditch banks or things like that that are a little bit higher and above the water table and they can burrow in those areas. But we also find them down Bayou Heron Road, you know, where it's even lower. So sometimes I'm not exactly sure how they persist there, but they tend to like it here, I think. Could you talk a little bit about their role in this ecosystem? Uh, gopher tortoises are a keystone species, so they build a burrow that's very deep and it provides habitat or refuge for all kind of different animals. Uh, we actually have two major species of pine trees that occur out here. We've got slash pine trees and we've got longleaf pine trees. Um, and the longleaf have uh, several adaptations that allow them to live in a fire prone environment. So one of the things um, I understand about these, the natural fires or prescribed burns is that with the um, the as you were mentioning the grasses um versus the uh, more um woody herbaceous mid-story uh -huh. the fires burn faster and they're not as intense because there's not as much fuel That's right. compared to this fire. um these species are adapted for that kind of um quick burning, lower intensity fire as compared to the, the fire that would, would burn a, a, a forest floor with more um, fuel? Right, right. So as, as we do our different treatments, like I talked about the mechanical treatments, you know, we're reducing the woody fuel that is out of sight. And so that decreases the fire intensity. The next time we have a fire at that site, it's a little less intense. And uh, that's beneficial for a lot of the species that um, depend on these habitats. Um, I had another point I was going to make about that. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I got, I got it back. Um, so one of the things I was going to mention was that, you know, a, another benefit of doing this type of work, especially when you're kind of surrounded by an urban area, um, like a lot of the Sandhill Crane Refuge, some areas here, um, is that you reduce the amount of woody fuel and you reduce the chance of a catastrophic wildfire that has impacts on the highways or has impacts on neighborhoods and things like that. So there, you know, in addition to the ecological benefits, there are a lot of very practical reasons uh, to do regular fires in the southeast. So you mentioned that some of these species actually need the fire. Um, some of them have... Um, seeds that don't sprout until just after a fire. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the longleaf pine is an example of a tree that uh, its cones are very resinous. They stay very tight and closed until they get a fire that forms that resin, allows the cone to open up and drop its seeds. And there are many other species that benefit uh, 
very much from a seeding perspective from prescribed burning of uh, uh, wire grass is one. So after a good year when you've had a fire in an area, the wire grass tends to have heavy seed um, and, and do very well. And so um, if we point out some of the animals that we, we are um, observing out here, I just saw a swallowtail butterfly fly by, probably within the screen of the shot. Um, there are uh, osprey nests here. Um, could you speak a little bit about the osprey? How close are we to the uh, water here? Because they are fishing birds. Yeah, we're, we're really close to water. Uh, we're a couple of miles, uh, maybe two and a half miles or so from um, kind of more of an open water area. But Bayou Heron runs, you know, kind of alongside um, Bayou Heron Road and kind of up towards 90. Um, but we are very close to the water and uh, osprey love building on these transmission poles. So almost every transmission pole all the way into Alabama, if you look that way, has an osprey and nest And if you turn and look that way, there are more of them that way. That's incredible. Go back west, yep, same thing. Do you have a population estimate from <laughs> no. just this line? We haven't done that yet. Uh, that would be something we should do maybe in the future. That's a good idea. And then you can hear a lot of insects and birds out here. That's right, yeah. Uh, there, I don't know as much about the insect communities, um, but we do have a project, hopefully, that's going to start pretty soon, uh, where a graduate student is going to look at the different bat species that inhabit oh, these areas, wow. and also the insect species, so she can understand that relationship between the predator and prey, and understand more about bats in these areas, and how they respond to management. And we also found, just at, on our walk out here, this uh, turtle. This is a box turtle. She was just wandering around out here, and we picked her up just to, to show. And um, so she is a box turtle. Kind of interesting about box turtle. She has maybe gotten used to being handled right now, so she is not um, too interested in pulling back all the way but they have a hinged um bottom shell to flash on so she could actually close herself into this shell so i'll mention this about the uh this pine savanna here we burned it in june i believe of this year so you know you look at this and you see how many things are blooming how tall the grass is already, they tend to recover very quickly. So we have a prescribed burn in an area like this, and within you know two weeks, we already have a lot of things coming back. It's very green. So um, what different, you mentioned the different plants that you monitor and right. the, um, and the, uh, the other group that's doing the herpetology surveys, um, could you talk about, and, and the birds that you uh -huh. monitor in the winter, is it just that particular species or do you look for other birds? We actually, we do two different types of surveys. We do one that is focused on grassland birds only. And so that one is the one that we tend to pick up on the Henslow sparrows in this management unit right here. Uh, we do another type of survey where we're more geared towards understanding what the bird community looks like as a whole and so that one is um, it's a little bit larger we walk a, a an area we call it area search and so we walk a large area within our management units we document every bird that we see because we want to understand are we starting to increase the number of species um, of interest like Henslow sparrows but we also want to understand are the bird communities changing at these sites as we do our management activities. And uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that uh, we have an excellent project team that is working together on this. So it's uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, it's the Grand Bay Near, the Mississippi DMR. Um, we are also considered to be in a coastal preserve, which is part of uh, the DMR. Um, we also work with Mississippi DEQ and we're constantly communicating about you know, our management activities, what we're finding with our monitoring. And so if we see that something's working really well somewhere, we can replicate that in another area uh, to get the results that we're looking for. 
if we see with our monitoring data that we're not getting the results we want, we can make changes and uh, maybe avoid certain things that we did uh, so we maximize uh, kind of the end goals and, and make sure we're getting to where we want to get with these units. Could you talk a little bit more about the process of the prescribed burning? Uh, sure. So you can see, if you look this way, you can see, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but there's a, a fire break right there, which is actually a fire lane. Wow. Um, so that is uh, a very important part of what we do. So we have to create these fire breaks because we don't want to start a fire that we can't stop. So we have to make sure we understand what the wind is doing, what the weather is doing. We kind of have to have the right conditions to do a prescribed burn. You have to go through a permitting process and all of those. You have a burn plan that you stick to. Um, but when we do an air, we do a burn in a certain area. Um, we want to make sure we understand the direction of the wind, and we want to create enough black areas that are downwind of the burn unit, so that when we light the fire that we call the head fire, which is kind of the most intense fire when we do a prescribed burn that it runs into that black that's already been burned and it doesn't jump the fire line and start a fire in an area we don't want to burn. So it ends up being a very technical thing and we have to have people on staff and we have to make sure our project partners, we all keep up with our uh, qualifications. Um, and one cool thing too about this project is that the folks that do the management sometimes help us out with monitoring and the folks that do the monitoring sometimes get on prescribed burns. So I think that's a very beneficial thing that we're working so closely together with our partners on this. You mentioned the total um, land area that you are managing with these different techniques. And, at, and you also said that they, they you burn them every two to three years, I think. Right. Um, but at any given time when you're doing a burn, how large an area would you burn? Oh, it varies very widely, and a lot of that depends on what is around the burn unit. So, in a case where maybe we're burning something that's kind of remote, it's very far from the road, um, we might could have uh, one of our management units be as large as 400 acres, 500 acres. But a lot of times, like this, this management unit here, I believe is uh, more along the lines of 100, 120 acres. Um, and that's because it's pretty close to Highway 90. It's pretty close to a couple of businesses that are along Highway 90. So we have to be a little more careful there. And how large a crew of people are monitoring the actual burning process? Uh, so as far as fire crews, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. So I would say anywhere from, you know, six to 12 people would be on a prescribed burn, sometimes more. Uh, and sometimes we burned this unit for the first time in a long time uh, a couple of years ago and uh, it was it's kind of a technical unit because of where it is in relationship to other things and we had a really large crew helping out with that one and we also had a crew of uh, women who were getting involved with prescribed burning and they were training and so because of that we ended up having a crew i think of more than 20 people helped out with that prescribed burn and a lot of people got good training from it so this one was burned two years ago? Is that, is that what you said? I believe it's been a little more than two years, probably two and a half years. Yeah. And so uh, this one was burned. Can you pan over to the side? When was this one burned? This one was burned this past uh, summer, late spring, early summer. So would that one have looked like this immediately after it burned? Or were there other things that happened over here to bring the um, understory down more? Yeah, this, this unit uh, has probably been under some type of management for as long as any inside the Grand Bay National Wildlife Refuge. This unit has really, to my knowledge, only had the one prescribed fire. So this one's had probably some select cutting, uh, several rounds, probably at least three or four rounds of prescribed burning. And that's you know very different than this unit. It's just okay. had a lot less of everything. So this one would not necessarily have looked like this one uh, within a couple of months of being burned. No, I think this one would probably need to go through another couple of rounds of prescribed fire, um, maybe some mechanical work as well. And then once you get it to this state, does it become easier to keep it in this state rather than um, you know 
starting with something like that? Absolutely. Uh, so as we do our management work, uh, the cost tends to go down over time, but it takes sometimes a lot of effort to get uh, a unit looking like this one, uh, to where you get that open landscape and that well-developed uh, herbaceous layer. And in some cases, things might not still be in the seed bank, so you might have to go in and do some planting or things yeah. like that to get things like wiregrass to come back. So far, we've had pretty good success with just doing our mechanical and fire treatments uh, to get those communities to come back. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was that we have a, a fairly good issue going on with exotic species. And so another component of the project is to chemically treat exotic species. Now we don't do that from a helicopter or broadcast spraying. It's actually coming out and doing uh, you know, hack and squirt or just spraying uh, patches of Kogan grass things like that mm. um, so that's another big component and this these areas right here we don't have hardly any invasive species issues but as you move up the road and down the road in some cases we have quite a bit of invasive species so even after you get if even after you resp restore one of these ecosystems to this state you still have to um, I mean maybe it's a little easier to manage it from that state but it's not where you can just walk away and and let it um, let it go because of the right. invasive species and it still needs the, right. the burning and um, and you do prescribe burns rather than allowing the natural burns is that right uh, for the most part yes um, we do have wildfires that occur periodically and you know we tend to want to get those uh, contained at least uh, we don't always extinguish them completely uh, you know if it's within a management unit and it can be contained um, we can let them burn in some cases that would be U.S. Fish and Wildlife that really handles the wildfire response, and we support that, and we will be involved in that in some cases. How would the wildfires start? Uh, in some cases, uh, lightning strikes can start them during really dry periods. Uh, quite a few get started from just people burning trash and things in their yards. You know, of course that happens. Um, but really, you know, for the most part, wildfires happen when we have a drought things get really dry and then they can start easily. The humidity is really low and things like that. So you had mentioned um, the like the total land area that you all are now endeavoring to manage. How much of that has sort of been restored to the Pine Savanna um, ecosystem state that you're that you're going for? Um, I would say we made a lot of good progress but you know, we want to get a lot of areas to kind of this state, and we don't have a lot of acreage that is in this state right now. We have a lot of areas that are in transition. Our uh, project focus area at this time is about 3,000 acres within the 28,000, um, but some of these areas are uh, in much worse condition than this area, which is, you know, a, an area in transition. So we have some areas that part of the project is land acquisition, and so we just acquired about 1,500 acres. Some of those areas haven't had a fire on them in uh, decades. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take some time and effort to get them back to where we want them to be. So this is a very big, um, that's a very big scale project. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, as we acquire new lands and, th and things change, um, we're able to incorporate some of these new areas into current management units and kind of build out kind of from the center point, which is really, we're kind of in the middle of our project area that we're focused on right now. And so we want to just kind of build on that over time. And, and the total duration of the project right now, it looks like it will run until at least 2028. So we kind of, it's a long-term project and we're very lucky to be a part of it. When you mentioned the fire suppression, is that just from previous efforts of, you know, fires aren't good? And Right. I think in a lot of ways, yes. I think uh, that message got uh, passed around a good bit. Uh, and it makes sense because you've got, you know, real threats. I mean, fire is a dangerous thing. And so, uh, you know, the more we develop and move into these natural areas, the more of a threat it becomes. Um, so I think it's a combination of our development and also, you know, people maybe 
being misinformed about fire and, and what it does. I mean, it is a natural disturbance and, and certain habitats require it. So in um, the early days of forest management, the fire suppression was kind of, there was kind of a policy of fire suppression, right? And then as they learned more about forest forestry, forest management, um, you know, they under, came to understand how important, you know, the role of fire was. That's right. What kind of um, timeline are we talking about there? What's that? As far as the, um, the period of fire suppression and uh, then yeah. sort of this coming to understand the role of um, the important role of fire and forest succession and um, these ecosystems and then starting that uh, that different kind of forest management right I would say it lasted a few decades you know that when that message was really being broadcast don't uh, only you can prevent forest fires like that type of language and things like that which is still I mean it's very relevant in some places and even here in some cases um, but yeah it's like everything I mean at one time I think historically I think people really understood the benefits of fire maybe not certainly not like we do now but they use fire um, Native Americans use fire uh, and I think you know our understanding of it as an industrialized nation is continues to evolve mm -hmm. and I think our understanding of the ecology of fire has definitely evolved and uh, so yeah I would say we, we started moving out of that probably in the 80s by the 90s I think you know uh, prescribed burning and things like that uh, really got got going in a better way in the southeast for sure. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, seed banks earlier and uh, how, how long will the seeds last in the ground before you end up start starting having to plant you know how long will they survive without growing in there wow that's a great question and i don't know if i could answer it uh i'd be kind of guessing i'll tell you this though um we've done some land management activities in certain areas that haven't had um, any kind of clearing or burning work done in a while and we see some positive things already so i you know i don't know I, it would differ depending on the species yeah. of course but um you know, hopefully, hopefully they last long enough that we won't have to do a ton of planting, but that is a possibility. Do you collect seeds from the existing areas? We do that. We actually do. Um, and we've got part of our monitoring team that also helps with management. Um, they have done a good bit of that lately, where they go out, they catch things that are seeding at certain times. They do a lot of seed collection. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to get a little pollinator garden started. Uh, north of here a little bit and so we've done some seed collection for that as well I was gonna say what are what are the main pollinators the, the pollinators themselves oh you know just insects of different uh, bees um, birds things like that just a normal yeah nothing that fauna. I, I'm no entomologist for sure but I can't I can't call too many of them out by name <laughs> Understood. but yeah I think it's just the normal ones and butterflies, things like that. Yeah. So, is um, could you could you just you mentioned it briefly the kogan grass, the right um, invasive grass? Uh, could you? I would imagine that would be a big threat here. Oh could yeah. Could you speak about kogan grass just a little bit more? Yeah, kogan grass. What I understand, it got started um, as a packing material on uh, cargo ships and things like that. They were entering, I think, Mobile Bay is one of the places where they came in or it came in initially and uh, it's now I mean you see it everywhere it's uh, all over the side of the highways and things like that I think people use it for erosion control in some place in some cases um, it tends to really like fire so you know when you burn an area that has kogan grass and you uh, reduce its competition for a short time it can come back pretty fierce and uh, it can kind of take over in certain areas so it you know, one of the only ways we can treat it effectively is with chemicals. We, we're not able to um, treat it very well with prescribed burning because uh, yeah. it lights fire and it burns very hot too, uh, which is sometimes not beneficial for the other plants around it. So in an area like this, you would just have to walk surveys and look for it and yeah, I think treat it, it when you find it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you have to do regular surveys, uh, and that's one of the things we do. We do some uh, invasive species mapping, 
And so we've been able to accomplish some of that with our GIS staff at DMR to map invasive species in real problem areas with drone imagery. And so that kind of helps us take a broad look at things uh, with the imagery. But you still have to get boots on the ground and uh, get a good look at everything. So it has, um, for our viewers uh, who might have seen it without realizing what it is, it's a tall graph. And um, as Dr. Pitchford mentioned, it's found on a lot of roadsides. And it makes these um, seed heads that are kind of white and fluffy and cottony looking. And so those seeds would, would blow around and spread. Do you have, I mean, out here you're maybe a little removed from where those seeds would would blow into here? Do you have buffer zones? To... Yeah, well, where we're standing, we don't have um, many issues. There's a little bit of coke and grass kind of along the boardwalk where we came out that we spray regularly. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say we're, we're definitely not immune from it. I mean, it still shows up from time to time because as you mentioned, it's wind dispersed. And so those seeds can make it into these areas and, and uh, you know, get started. So we, it's, uh, it's a tough one, you know? It, and you know, if you drive along Highway 90 or Interstate 10 and they're blooming, it looks like it's snowing sometimes on the mm -hmm. interstate. That's mm -hmm. the grass seed. So um, it's a tough one. <laughs> So this is a big job you're managing out here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of gets back to, we titled it Gems of the Gulf Coast. Uh, you know, I, it would be great if we could do this type of work everywhere, but I understand that it's cost prohibitive in some cases. So I consider this area definitely a gem and something that, you know, it's worth the investment um, to make it uh, look somewhat like it looked historically and uh, Know, conserve areas like this so that people can come see you know what what used to be and, and maybe even what the potential is for other areas mm -hmm. is there anything else you'd like to add i think i hit most of it <laughs> and um if you have any questions feel free to leave those in the comments and we'll try to get those questions answered um thank you for joining us we will continue to bring the boardwalk talks to you virtually through Facebook live um, indefinitely at this point. So we have the boardwalk talks on the first and third Wednesdays of the month.